Hey everyone, welcome to Celine TV. It's Celine Chinoy, your guide to creative success. In this episode, I am pleased to be speaking with Carol Adrian, an internationally known author, intuitive counselor, and coach whose books have been translated into 15 languages. During my conversation with her, she was kind enough to share some insights on how we can connect with our purpose and also our intuitive voice so that we can become more authentic in our creative expression and in our lives. A successful creative in her own right, Carol has written several books such as The Purpose of Your Life, Finding Your Place in the World Using Synchronicity, Intuition, and Uncommon Sense, which was hailed by Oprah Winfrey as a must-read. Carol is also the author of When Life Changes, or You Wish It Would, and Find Your Purpose, Change Your Life. She has also written companion guides to the best-selling book, Celestine Prophecy. She worked with James Redfield in co-authoring experiential guides for both the Celestine Prophecy and the Tenth Insight. Carol also has passion for numerology and how it can help people find insights about themselves and a sense of purpose or direction. A master numerologist, she has authored two books on the subject and offers in-depth personal reports and provides free offerings such as daily and weekly numerology forecasts, daily inspirational messages on her website, caroladrian.com. I hope you'll enjoy watching my interview with Carol as much as I enjoyed speaking with her. Hi, Carol. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for making the time to speak with me today. I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, learning more about you and getting your insights into some very interesting topics. Great. I'm really excited to uh, see where we go with this. Okay, great. So, um, I was thinking that we start off right from the beginning of your career. When did you realize that, um, you know, that you wanted to get into like esoteric or metaphysical kind of uh, sciences and that you wanted to help people, you know, find their life purpose and get more in tune with themselves? Like, when did you realize that? Well, I don't think it, those two things came together, actually. Okay. Um, you know... I'm a big reader, and I started reading metaphysical books, anything I could find in the library from from a young age. Okay. And I was just always so really interested. And uh, in, in, as to when my career uh, started, I would say it didn't seem like a career at the beginning at all, but it was my interest in numerology that was the thing that just fascinated me. And that started um, officially when I was in my, like, when I was about 32. And um, I wanted to change my name. I had been divorced, and I decided I needed to change my name. Okay. So um, I had to mention this to a, somebody I just met at a party. Uh-huh. And she said, oh, you need to use numerology to do that. And the minute I went over to her house, and the minute that I saw my chart, I, something went off in my head. And that was the beginning of my fascination. So that really gave me the tool that I started exploring, but it was not because I thought it was going to be my career. It was so it started out as a hobby, something that you really just a fascination. Mm-hmm. And I read everything I could about it. I kept reading, and I had day jobs. I was working as an office assistant somewhere, okay. and I would keep working. And, and I decided at some point, oh, I think I'll I want to write down everything I've been learning, and I wanted to just kind of hold on to it my own way. Sure. And so I started the manuscript, which it never occurred to me that I was writing a book. But uh, later on, when I was working with a friend uh, in her business, she just started the literary agency. And she said, oh, why don't I take that manuscript and see if I can sell it? And so I sold my first book on numerology, which was called The Numerology Kit. And it stayed wow. in print for like 25 years. So um, that was my first kind of fledgling effort at writing. You know what I find interesting, Carol, is that everything seemed to fall into place for you. It was like, you know, one after the other, all the events were, you know, everything seemed to fall into place. There was some kind of synchronicity going on. Don't you think so? Well, I think it happens for everybody, really, if we pay attention. Um, Those are 
pretty exciting days. And I, when I look at it, I think, well, I wasn't trying to do anything. I wasn't trying to write a book. I wasn't trying to do anything. What was compelling me was always my passion for numerology and for talking with people. And I, even though I had office jobs, mm-hmm. I had second, you know, part-time uh, practice with my um, counseling. And I, I, in, I not only had the numerology, but I added to it my interest in psychology. I eventually had gotten a degree in psychology, archetypal psychology, because that really fascinated me. But I, again, I didn't do it because I thought I could get a job with it. I just have always followed my passion. I really can't put it any other way. And yeah. it wasn't until I got into a really bad place in my life where I was... I had been ill with cancer, I had gotten divorced, I had no money, I was living with a friend just because she took me in. Yes. And I thought to myself, well, what, 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 what can I do, what am I willing to do to make more money? Mm-hmm. And by listening to my intuition that day, mm-hmm. I really did. I thought, what am I willing to do? I wasn't willing to wait tables anymore, no, nothing wrong with that, but yeah. I just couldn't just sleep to it. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, I've always liked writing, maybe I would help somebody with their writing. When you have an intuition, it's really important to follow up on it. Sure. So I thought, well, who do I know in writing? I had my old friend Candace, who, had, like I said, started a literary agency. So I called her and I said, you know, if you come across a project, I, I need to make some extra money so I can move out of my friend's house and get my own place. And so by the end of the day, she called me back and she said, oh, yes, there's a doctor here who has a project. He needs help writing his manuscript. Mm-hmm. So, you know, once you ask the universe for help, you got to follow through. So I went over to talk to him. I had no resume on writing or anything. He didn't even ask me to look at you know, a, a sample of my writing. We just got along. The secret is to there was he actually, he actually himself was familiar with numerology. So we had that in common. He hired me. I got money for that. And more importantly, I was able to learn how to write a book. I didn't pay to do it, actually, because then I thought, oh, I get it. It's sort of like a big term paper. You just have to organize the chapters, and luckily I had a good editor. And after that came my other opportunities to do writing much more on my own topic, let's say. Okay. So it seems like you were guided by your intuition all that time. How how can someone, you know, how can, how can they... Like, learn to trust their intuition. How do they know when their intuition is speaking to them? That is such a good question, which, of course, I hear constantly with with, uh, my clients, too. And it is hard to know. You don't always know what's right, what's right, or if it's going to work out. You just don't know that. You're not going to get a clear guarantee. And I actually said that in my second book, uh, When Life Changes, or You Wish It Would. Um, I have the list there because people usually won't take one step toward a goal or what they feel is something they want to accomplish unless they feel, oh, I've got it all mapped out, I know exactly where I'm going, and I have 100% certainty that this is it. Well, you don't know that. If you, if you have that frame of mind, it holds you back. You yeah. never do anything. Well, maybe you do it in your own time. I'm not saying anything, but it holds you back. So yeah. the, way, the way I feel it, I am... You have to get quiet. It helps if you spend some time, like early in the morning works for me. Mm-hmm. Sometimes in the middle of the night. Although in the middle of the night, you tend to get a lot of fears coming up yeah. as well. So, intuition is not an urgent voice. Like, you've got to do this. You've got to do it now. Do it now. This That's is what happens if you go I find your boss. I've got to buy this boss right now. So, the will go back. No, it's not like that. Yeah. Intuition just comes and says something in one sentence, usually. If you hear it. Other people don't hear it. Like, I'm not saying I hear voices. I'm just saying yeah. um, there was a time when I was in between after I found numerology and I, went, I was feeling, I don't know, I just knew I had to come back to California. I was living in New Mexico only for one year. And I thought, oh, that was it. But yeah. it didn't work out. My intuition, I woke up one morning and I thought, it's over. And I had this feeling. It was more of a gut feeling like, this is over. I have to go back to California. I don't know how else to explain it. And then I thought, hmm, maybe this is a time that I should go to graduate school. Mm-hmm. I hadn't really wanted to do that, but I heard that, go to graduate school. My first thought was, okay, I better get into the right place first. So I moved back to California, and I started looking around for schools. This is an example of using your intuition in progress when you're doing something. I interviewed some schools, and I remember going out to San Francisco State, mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that, I went to undergrad there, 
And I was talking to somebody who's a psychologist in his office, and he was like, oh, Chrome 11, you sitting in a smid black office yeah. talking about how you could only go to school at night, okay? you know, <laughs> or during the day, okay? and now it's a single mother. Yeah. And I was like, I thought to myself, the sign here is, I don't want to wind up like this guy. <laughs> yeah. That isn't the right place. So my intuition just sort of said, mm, no, and keep moving. I did that for a while, and then I finally had to give up for a year. I, I got into one program, then I couldn't get a job, part-time job, to support myself in school. So there, I, that was like a negative synchronicity. Yeah. So I felt that, went and got a job in Berkeley for a year in a medical office, and then my friend called me. She said, oh, I've been around the world, I've been checking things out, and I think we should go to this this program in archetypal psychology, the same school that I had applied for. Okay. So it was like, then the timing was right. So you really have to try some things, listen for some clue, follow it up, mm -hmm. and then the next one, and the next one. But you have to take, you have to trust that there's something there that's behind this idea that you just got. If you have a passion, it's there for a reason. True, but how do you know that it's not your fear or your ego getting in the way. You know what I mean? Because that tends yeah. to make things a little bit unclear. The ego is always there. Yes. It's pretty much you're always working with a, an urgent voice that wants to do something else, mm -hmm. wants mm -hmm. to do something bigger, better, make you richer, stronger, exactly. um, or famous. That's the ego. Yeah. And we have, to, we have to have some sort of a center uh, in our lives, but it's important to recognize that, that when that happens and you're in a grip of something and you're struggling and you're efforting, mm -hmm. there's a difference between persevering because you want to keep doing something and you're putting attention to it and you are making an effort to do something. But when you're struggling and you know fighting something and worried all the time and anxious, that's your ego not getting its needs met and that's where you have to fall back and say, you know what? It is what it is. I, yeah. I'm okay the way I am. If I never do another thing, I'm going to be okay. It's not giving up. It's more of a surrendering to what yeah. is happening. So and don't time it. it. Timing. So don't, the fighting of it is the ego. Sure, yeah. And you kind of feel it in your body. I know that happens to me. When, when my ego is at play, I feel like my body contracts and I feel yes. you know, very, very good. sense I, of uneasiness, you know? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because it's very important to really not overlook the body's response to things. Yeah. Because that, like I said, when I was interviewing that guy who seemed to be all crunched up in his office, yeah. you have to listen to, your body's going to tell you. If you, uh, during the day, if you want to practice, like when you go to bed at night, mm -hmm. you can practice listening to your, how did I do intuitively today? And like, yo, know, when I was interviewing so-and-so, what was I feeling? Sometimes in the moment, you may not be fully aware of it, mm -hmm. but when you go back, yeah, you know, God, I got a stomachache after I left that office. There's a message in that. So that a lot of people are really attuned by their their physical responses, yes. and the intuition acts through that. So really learn to trust that. Get in tune with your own way of picking up information. Okay. Okay, that's that's great. And what do you think is people? What is the biggest misconception people have when it comes to finding out their life purpose? Because I know a lot of people stress out about it. Oh, I don't know, you know, what my purpose is. I don't know what I'm here on earth to do. You know, like what? 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 What, what do people? What is the biggest mistake people make when it comes to trying to find their life purpose? Yes, that's it. That's that's so true. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's the primary thing that I usually work with people when I'm doing their consultations. Yes. So yes. it comes as that, that idea comes in in so many different ways. Basically, I think the misconception is that we think it's some big, important thing and we're not being important enough. Now, that's one way of saying it. Mm -hmm. um, it's Again, that's the ego's idea of what our purpose is. Oh, yes. I know I'm here to make a difference in the world, but what is it? Like, you're supposed to be like a great politician or some singer or something that's bigger than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Actually, you, you already are born with your purpose, I believe this, and you come into life with certain talents and interests and way of looking at the world. And your purpose is to um, express your gifts, yourself. How do you do things? How do you do it? It isn't so much, I think that probably a, a major misconception is thinking that purpose is a job title. Oh, oh. 
If I'm a fireman, oh, I have to be a nurse. I have to be a fighter. I'm a poet. I'm a this or that. You you may be a lot of things in in different moments or different periods of your life. Those are more like roles, yeah. Yeah, and it's like your purpose is really to be happy. (laughs) Some of the (laughs) teachers that you read will read, your purpose, the Buddha will say, purpose of life is happiness. It doesn't sound like you think Buddhism is that way, but that is what the Buddha said. Yeah. Your purpose of life is to be happy. Mm-hmm. Well, that means what? Staying in the moment and being with what is around you mm-hmm. rather than thinking ahead, oh my God, tomorrow I should be like this, or oh my God, you know, one like, you know, I'm not getting ahead fast enough. Everybody else is making 40000 more a year than I am, and so That's on. That's the so ego forth. again, right? That's the so, The purpose is, it is very important to have a sense of purpose at all times. You know, like, what's my purpose? You know, when when I was younger, I mean, I'm thinking, when I was a single mother, my purpose was to make enough money to have my kids, you know, bring up my kids. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't thinking in some grand scale. Mm-hmm. I was making, I mean, I took care of that. But in the meantime, I was studying numerology. I was studying spiritual books. You know, I was meeting people. I was in, trying to figure out how the world worked. I was educating myself. My purpose was sort of to keep growing spiritually, and I wouldn't have said that because that sounds to me very pompous, <laughs> but it's to keep growing into the things that I'm most interested in. <laughs> That's really what it amounts to. Yeah. And um, to help other people along the way to be there for people. My my daughter, who's now just turned 50 last week, mm-hmm. wrote me a card thanking me for our party, and she said that she felt that my gift to her was that I was always accepting that I was an accepting person. And you know, she never said that to me before. And I and I thought, oh my God, I, I get that. Now I I, I was thinking about my, my life of half my birth path numbers in eleven two. Two is kind of accepting. That's one way I could have said it. I wouldn't have thought of it myself. Right. And I thought, well that's a purpose in life to be with people and to be a sounding board for people. To be accepting of what you're hearing and listening to them and giving them energy. That is part of my purpose, although it, it wasn't something I would have articulated myself, you know. But I also, I like to get, right now in this part of my life, I'm getting back into art a little bit, mm-hmm. painting, um, which I was interested in from my early years mm-hmm. um, as a girl and then in my 20s. And now, again, I'm just like, I'm not going to become a professional painter, but it's something that interests me. And I love to go to museums. Yeah. And See Aboriginal art and some of these vibrant new painters. My purpose is to just keep surrounding myself with beauty, right? Now. Right. And so it's like order, it's like right. the essence. Your purpose is like the essence of what yes. you're supposed to be doing versus something that's literal, right? Or Thank like you. A, Excellent. That's yeah. a very good way to put that. Yes, it really is. And you know, there's a lot of studies that show. Purpose is just so important in life. It, you know, throughout life, they make studies of older people, and, and it, it, you know, people who have a purpose, they live longer. Their their cognitive ability stays stronger. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're happier. They're nicer to be around. I mean, yeah. you you have to find some purpose, no matter what situation you're in, no matter what you you might find your limitations are around you. Sure. There's always a way to interact with the world in a purposeful manner and to yeah. and to Keep growing yourself. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, people who have who live with purpose, they they have this charisma about them. They have the sense of, I don't know, they just they just happier. They seem more joyful, you know. Well, like every day, life is just such a <laughs> yeah. yeah. It brings a lot of different things every day. Some that are good, some that are not so good. But sure. it's it still means you're you're still ticking. You're still here. Exactly. Okay, so I know you talked a little bit about numerology. You are a master numerologist. Um, could you tell us a little bit about numerology, the science behind it, and how we can help someone develop more awareness about themselves um, and also about their life purpose? Mm-hmm. Well, it is an ancient science, as they call it an art and a science, but um, we, we, it harkens back to the founder, which was Pythagoras, the Greek mm-hmm. philosopher and mathematician, and he said the whole world is ordered by number. So okay. we do. There's every, uh, you know, a number every minute of the day, practically. A phone number, an address, a time, uh, whatever. 
everything is numbers. Well, numerologists have discovered or created a system which shows you the value of the nine numbers. We usually work with the numbers one through nine. Okay. And uh, we use other compounds too, but each one has a has a essential interest or essential quality. Let's say with the number one, it stands for independence and being a pioneer and forward thinking. Okay. Two, as I mentioned, is people oriented. So each one describes a basic human quality. Mm-hmm. By looking that, you take apart your name that you were born with, and we believe that your birth name mm-hmm. has all the qualities within it, within you that kind of mark who you are. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. The names I just never get tired of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and birth. So we work with those two major categories, and a lot of calculations you do simple, adding up or sometimes subtracting, but it's mostly adding. It's very simple to learn, much easier than, for example, astrology. Mm-hmm. And um, so when you, just, you pull apart all these numbers, the art of it is to see how the numbers work together. Now, in I was just um, thinking of a, of a woman I, I worked with last week, and she came in, and she um, was one of, her main, uh, one of her main problems, she thought, was a problem, mm-hmm. uh, besides where she was going. She was in her 50s, and she was okay. doing a lot of spiritual study, and she was wondering if she should get divorced from her husband because she felt he wasn't keeping up with her. I'm always oh. married when I say that. Oh, yeah. So she was more spiritually advanced. That's what she's saying. She okay. That's a, to me, even to say that means that you're not all that spiritually advanced. Exactly. Exactly. Because then she would be more accepted. Somebody isn't acting like you are, so they must be lower on the ladder. <laughs> well, that, that was fun. I didn't say anything. But she was uh, really concerned because in an everyday situation, she wanted to travel. She wanted to go to seminars. She was going. She's on fire. She wants to read all these new books, meet new people. And her husband, gentle, perfect soul when he was, he just didn't want to do it. He didn't want to go with her. He wanted to stay home. He was perfectly happy. He's a woodworker, I think. He was, you know, he was out there in the studio working and doing his thing. He had no desire to travel, read any of the books she was interested in reading. He didn't mind that she did it. He was perfectly happy for her to go off and do it. But she's thinking, oh, this isn't right. No, 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 I have to get rid of him so I can be even more big than me. Extremely independent. So I said, well, let's just look. Tell me his name, Grace. So we just did a mini analysis of him. She immediately got the picture. Right now, she's under a uh, current influence that's heavily at the number one. Mm-hmm. But she has a time. If it comes up, you generally do feel like, hey, I want a new identity. I want to explore. I want to be different. I want to change my hair, you know, yeah. do something. He is a four. He has so many fours all around him. Four are like four tables on, four legs on the table. You know, solid, <laughs> practical. <laughs> He likes, he doesn't like change. He doesn't, he likes his routine. He, he's comfortable there. He's he knows who he is and he's not going to, you know, to change. Why should he? He doesn't have to. He's happy. Sure. The minute, I tell you, it's so in, the minute that I, we started talking about this, she, the light bulb went off of her. Talking about elimination. She said, oh my God. I get it. That's exactly how it is. Oh, I see now. And I said, oh, I thought, well, this is good. Perhaps this is saving your marriage. Yeah. So, she, so that was a vivid example of two people, I mean, just in a short time, but really allowing the numbers to speak and say, this is how it looks, how do you think it is, and then this is the way it is. So the numbers can do that. They can also show you kind of where you are, that we're always in a nine-year cycle, which is very important to know. That's your personal year cycle. So that's calculated off your month and day of birth, sure. which is added to universal year. So... Then so we know, so like oh, a I'm either in the beginning period or yeah. I'm getting ready to complete somewhere along the line. Each year yeah. has its sort of goals to do, and it's really helpful if you know them. It just gives you a little bit more confidence that you're on the right track, and you can break that down into the monthly ones too. So I put a, I put a weekly forecast on my website, for example. It's free, and I'll let people see. I, I write the forecast based on the personal year so they can see this week might be like this. Okay. So does that give you some idea? Sure. So people, you know? kind of, so people have cycles, you're saying, depending on their number, right? Yes. Yes. You have pretty big cycles. Yeah. There's one that's four. Um, there's four. It's called a pinnacle, which okay. is just the word we use for a time of achievement with a challenge. 
everybody gets four of those, and they're very interesting because when I'll go over them with people, they will, they're you know, with specific ages, like from birth until, let's say, age 35 or age 28, and then the next one continues for nine years, the next one is nine years, and the last one is for the rest of your life. And a lot of times, so many times, these end of peri- the end of these uh, periods will coincide with someone getting a divorce or you know changing jobs or going starting their own business, mm-hmm. and each mm-hmm. one kind of hints at what you're supposed to be doing during that time. So those are the so big chunks of time, and then the personal year is more moving to the current, the right. personal month, and then the weeks. Okay, so you tap into those energies once you know that say you're you're having a number one year, so you just you know you go for it. Right. Instead of slowing yes. down and, you know. Well, yeah, and the one year marks a time when you feel a shift. Now, I try to, to advise people that, you know, don't expect everything to look completely different this year. It depends on a lot of different factors of where they are and, you know, just a lot. But basically, it is, if you look back and think, yeah, you know, I did take a different direction that time. It's not always obvious by, you know, January 1st. And, and I do believe that the personal year uh, begins and ends. It begins on January and ends in December 31st for everybody, no matter if, even if your birthday's in December. Oh, okay. um, there's, there's a thought on that. There's some people think it starts and ends on your birthday, but I found it to be most accurate when it's January to December 31st. But like I say, with the one year, it is a beginning period. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, some new things will come into your life or you'll get some new interests. Mm-hmm. And uh, or a desire to move or change your name or do something. I do a lot of name changes with people around probably the personal year of nine and going into a one because they didn't feel it, even if they don't know numerology to begin with. So, yeah, and then um, you just kind of uh, feel out each of the uh, vibrations for the year, plus the fact that there's another number, which is more hard to calculate. It's not something I can just show you how to do, but yeah. it's an S. Number and that one's fascinating too, mm-hmm. and it points out another aspect. So, by putting them together, I try my best to let my intuition come in and offer something. And I'm surprised myself at how accurate it tends to be with people when they talk about their actual issues right now. That's so interesting. I know it's so fascinating. You can see why well, I can never give it up. Because yeah. yeah, I'm always going to do like I'm gonna. Once, uh, maybe today or so, I want to um, put some more um, of the uh, the vibrations for like the major companies about the Fortune 500 Chevron. I put some of them up already on my website. Uh, I like to look at the names of companies and just see, oh, what does that show me? Uh, um, I so do a analysis when I see something interesting. Oh, so even businesses have their own numbers. Businesses have their own numbers. And uh, it's wow. quite fascinating to see... You know, I have a, it's a little grid system that I work with to put circles around the numbers to see how many of each uh, number yeah, appears in yeah. what they're, and what that characteristic, how that stands out for them. Yeah. And then you add up the values of the numbers in another calculation that gives you a, like a destiny total. So most of the time I just work with the names. I usually don't know when they incorporated or what their birth date would be. But you know, you do what you can. And it's just interesting to see. To me, it's interesting Very to see things look on paper. Yeah, yeah. Wow, thanks for sharing, Carol. And I have one mm-hmm. last question. So, um, I've heard a really beautiful Japanese term called satori. Have you heard of it, satori? Uh, sorry. Which, satori, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which, uh-huh. which, which means sudden enlightenment and... Uh-huh. Uh, or, you know, consciousness attained through intuitive illumination. Have you ever mm-hmm. had any of those experiences in your life? And if you have, how can one experience more of these Satori moments? Well, it's very interesting to um, to look at the word because what it means in, in Buddhism is it means the ordinary. Okay. And yet when, you, when one talks about it, mm-hmm. one is thinking, oh, that must be some out of the ordinary, extraordinary enlightenment feeling that must be just fantastic. But it actually means the ordinary nature of yourself. So it isn't something that you can will. You can't make it happen. It's a state of grace, really. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 
it's the sense of suddenly, when it comes over you, you're suddenly aware of the perfection of the moment. Sure. It's, it's as if you understand everything without knowing what you're even understanding, I guess. Uh, it's just this sudden flooding of wisdom or understanding, and that basically the idea is that the feeling you come away with is everything is perfect. It's all perfect the way it is. That is the whole purpose of, of Buddhism, is to accept everything the way it is. That it's, there's a certain perfection in the most unusual or maybe horrendous. Uh, I'm not saying it's all good things that you want to have in your life, but life is as it is. Yes. And that is a supportive experience. So the irony is that to try to have it, it goes against the way of having it because it's all about letting go. And it happens, it happens. Uh, and it doesn't need to happen. I, 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 one of the books I love a lot is like, um, well, there's a lot of these kind of uh, Buddhist teaching books, but um, Suzuki Roshi was a great teacher here in California. And, um, he said, you know, somebody asked him, like, oh, I had this sudden enlightening, I felt like expanded the whole world, I was just filled with joy. And is that enlightenment? And, and Suzuki Roshi said, yeah, that's enlightenment. But now, how's your work going? It's like, so what? It doesn't, it's just there. And so, so it's a way of being. You know, it, huh? So is it a way it's, of being? It's a, it's a way of recognizing, going into your natural, ordinary self and recognizing that you are who you, you are yourself. If you haven't, you are born with the nature of life is here. You are part of life at right. this moment. And realizing, oh, hey, that, here I am. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's like, it's always, Satori would be certainly, you know, you, it would be nice if you uh, meditate. What, there's many benefits to meditating anyway. So you wouldn't be doing it just to get enlightenment because I doubt it would happen that way. It could happen. I had a woman come to me, and she had an experience like this at a stoplight in Australia. She's one of my clients, and she said, I was just, between the time that the light turned from red to green, she said, I don't know, something happened in my mind, and I suddenly understood everything. Wow. She had it at the stoplight. So, um, you know, it, I don't know. I suppose it might be helped along if you meditated on a regular basis, sure. which would mean sitting still. That's a, that's a good thing to do to increase your intuition. Because you're in tune with your inner nature, and mm -hmm. um, you let the flow. And with Satori, there's no grasping out of wanting to do anything else other than be existing there. And then the flow comes into you, the inward flow in your nature that is more recognizable to you. And there's a feeling of peace and alrightness, which is everyone can have. So you're saying that people can access this more if they practice stillness, if they're more accepting of the situations, if they practice non-resistance, because that's what I'm getting from, from whatever you're saying. Non-resistance. So. Yeah. Um, get, when, I'm not sure I understand when you said can get this more. more. I mean, can get can be more in tune with their intuition and get more of these satori yeah. moments when... They kind of declutter their mind and they're not, you know, having these incessant thoughts. Because I know when I'm stressed out and when I'm overthinking, I find it much more difficult to, um, you know, to have the, that feeling of, be, I, I just cannot be present when I'm stressed out, first of all, you know, and I'm just, You're, I, I feel yeah. like I'm swimming upstream. So I think mm -hmm. that's the biggest takeaway I can get, you know, from from learning this practice. Yeah. 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 I, I would say that um, it's we all do this. We get wrapped up. That's the ego. Like the urgency, the time speediness, gotta check the email one more time. Yes. I mean, if you're going to do anything, I would say unplug your phone five minutes a day if you can afford, you know, if you can stand to do it and then increase it to ten minutes a day. Yeah. I was talking to somebody the other day it's just being riddled by her phone. And the funny thing is, she wanted to get some writing done, mm -hmm. and she had, she had time. But I said, "Well, you can talk about her schedule and what she was doing, and how she." I believe if you want to write, you put it in your calendar and you commit to writing at a certain time that works for you. 
Monday, Wednesday morning, whatever it might be, yeah. 10 minutes, a half an hour, but you do it. And I said, what do you do when you get up in the morning? Well, I first check my phone. Well, that's what her time gets away from her. So I said, well, can you, is there, have you noticed anything so riveting there that you have to take care of it immediately? And like, are you an emergency nurse or what? I mean, <laughs> what is so urgent that you must respond to everybody's every thought? Yeah. Just don't look at your phone for at least, you know, the first part of the morning. And then go to it when you need to. But, I mean, they, to be on call with something like that, mm-hmm. it's going to rattle you. Mm-hmm. And I think this is something more and more people have to deal with. Right. It's just going to make you feel on purpose, like you're not getting anything done. Well, yeah, you're right. You take control of your time and you set aside a time for something like that. But then your priority has to be the purpose that you have right now. If you want to write or develop your poetry or get your singing together, whatever. Right? It doesn't have to be anything even that creative. You can control your time. If you if you have a goal to keep in shape, you make time in the morning to do your treadmill or you're walking around the block. Yeah. That is your that's your commitment to yourself. That's how you keep your life in, in order. And then that restless mind, your monkey mind, will naturally settle back because it will have gotten some satisfaction that you actually reached the goal yeah. that you set recently. Like, and that will help you simmer down. Yeah, and that will, I think that helps you stay mindful, right? Then that's the whole, that's what you need to do. You need to stay right. mindful of what's going on and be aware of when your thoughts get out of hand. And yeah, and what you your know. body is telling you. And what your body, How, what your body doing, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah, unfortunately the world exactly. is getting busier and busier and there's just so much noise out there. It's becoming more challenging for people to do that. So I think... You know, this this is important. This is an important practice. This is, this is, you know, they need to be more aware of that happening, that tendency to get too busy and caught up with the world. Uh, just be aware of are there places in my life where I'm doing something that doesn't have that much meaning for me right now. Be yeah. honest. You yeah. know, it, when there's something that you really want to do, you put your heart and soul into it, and That's you don't true. care about the time. That's a sign of when you're on purpose. Is when you're yeah. working and Doing something and you just want it, you don't even notice the time going by. Right. That's like what you're trying to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Sarah, thank you. Thanks so much, Carol. Uh, we're done for the interview. All right. Thank you so all much right. for making time to speak with me. And uh, I'm going to be providing all your information uh, so people can contact you if they want to learn more about you and, of course, if they want to work with you. So thank you so much again. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you too, Celine. Right, you have My a, pleasure. You have a wonderful day. Hello. Take care. Bye.